Hey folks, how's it going, Masher? And welcome back to episode of Cards and Castles, a TV commentary. And as always, we've got some great matches lined up for you today on this episode. So without further delay and without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into game one and see what both players have brought to the table for us today. All right, folks, and game number one is going to be Hector taking on Tucker. One, two, three, both seasoned veterans in the game, of course. Let's see what both are bringing to the table. Hector on the Viking Ninja, Tucker on the Viking Druid here. And, uh, all right, I mean, oh, oh. Tucker on, I guess, a lot of companions, but I guess with Druids, it makes sense. Companions are pretty much the backbone of that faction. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, nothing that we can really tell by this hand right now. Beast Smash would be an interesting call. Maybe has something to do with the Mystic Journey, because um, even with the Beast Master's side effect, it's still very much worth it to get a Mystic Journey pop and rush a whole lot of beasts toward the enemy. Although Tucker forced to play Spiny here, turn three as Hector with the Dragon Temple to turn before. And the Fire Drake on turn three, revealing that dragons are going to be the go here for uh, his side. And uh, this should be a pretty, I guess, fair matchup to say the least here. We'll see if maybe Tucker falters a little bit because we see Hector's got that global presence already with the Dragon Temple. Although Centaur going to go ahead and make a move here. Beast Your Rage on the Centaur as well. Buffed because of the Spiny in play. Beautiful work there. Popping a bit of the castle as well as removing the Dragon Temple. Unfortunately, can't find the location of the Shadow Drake. And of course, going to reveal himself to be very close to the enemy. Of course, going to head uh, take four from the Shadow Drake. A little explosion from the Fire Drake. Green Drake coming out as well. We're going to see a chain of Drakes, it feels like, for this episode. Beast Master are going to come in here and do some effective work, I want to assume here. Uh, I'm going to clean up the Fire Drake. Yep, going to pop the Beast Master and the Shadow Drake when you kind of have to. Uh, Bear gets popped, and unfortunately, no reanimate to uh, support us on this one. No big deal, though. Uh, another Green Drake, though, is going to be a little bit of an issue here. Dragon Search going to reveal another Fire Drake for Hector's Arsenal as well. We do have the Mystic Journey like we were talking about before. That is a nice factor in this matchup. Uh, but we'll see how far it goes here. Uh, Tucker going to go ahead and shotgun this now on the Rat King, which I don't know if I like that per se. It feels like this was a bit unnecessary although uh i maybe because he wants to remove some of these green drakes a little bit here and kind of knock each other out weaken them severely but i don't know it feels like a waste of the message journey we could have maybe used that when there were more globals in play but uh until then we do have these uh dragons to contend with more of them coming out by the way fire drake and the faithful drake as well as the lumberjack pushing on up there's another mystic journey though that could be actually very helpful in this time uh, we'll see if maybe we can actually use the Fire Drake to our advantage here. If we use the Beast Master to pop Mystic, yep, just along these lines here, we could actually use the, uh, yep, Explosion there to make the bear a bit stronger. Yep, beautiful work there. We could have actually, though, defended our Beast Master a bit more here. Um, he didn't have to die. I think the positioning, we could have thrown him uh, two spaces below to still get the, uh, the proper Beast value, if you will. Uh, so a slight little misstep here, but I guess maybe Tucker is afraid of Aeroth. In this case, Aeroth would not have uh cared if beastmaster was uh up here or down here but still uh we could have protected the beastmaster here and allowed these beasts to bit uh to live a bit longer to make some better trades rather than us just losing beastmaster and then losing those two additional beasts here yeah you're seeing right now green dragon to pop in there we do lose both the wolf and the bear and uh hector's forces moving relatively unopposed yarm giant though looking to make some moves here uh, runs into the shadow drake uh which unfortunately can't get rid of said Shadow Drake, leaving uh, it pushed back here. But we do have the ability to, uh, I guess, maneuver that Shadow Drake again here. I guess we could have used a Lumberjack to hit face and traded with the Shadow Drake instead. But the idea behind that is that you want the bigger attack to survive here to mean more damage uh, moving into face here. Plus, Hector picking up the draw from the Lumberjack is still very, very good. Uh, more dragons, though. Shadow Drake, Faithful Drake, and Alunda, another Lumberjack on the floor here and this is getting a little bit dire from tucker 
Uh, Tucker's got no real way to push back here. And we do see he's opting to just really dump the hand. Centaur, Spiny, Drake Dance, all for a measly three damage on face. We do pop the Shadow Drake, though, I guess, which is very important here. Avoiding that six damage to uh, to the dome. And, of course, the other Shadow Drake not in uh, range to hit Castle here, meaning that uh, Tucker's life is safe for a bit longer, but for who knows how long. Trap going down here, some maneuvering on the board here, and Beast Smash to the pickup for Tucker. It'd be very nice to kind of get this in action here to uh, get some more bodies on the board. I feel like uh, Tucker's been lacking in that most of the game, so to kind of see that is very reassuring here. Another Dragon Siege, though, coming out. Uh, doing some big damage here. Uh, four to face here. The Shadow Drake a bit healthier now at 6-4, four, four, seven on the Faithful. It's uh, it's not good. And, of course, the Might of the Minotaur. Oh, no. Ayajitsu. Excuse me. Uh, Ayajitsu coming out here and uh, proving to be a bit of a nuisance. Uh, of course, the plus four, plus first strike means that uh, Tucker really can't get rid of this thing on the board. Instead, opting to kind of push everything far forward here, but the Cloak of Ice on the Shadow Drake neutralizes that incoming Yarm here. Beast Master getting popped by the Faithful here, removing the Bear Hog as well. Tucker kind of purely working off the draw here, and unfortunately is not going to do it, pulling a Lumber and... Uh, not, war, a lum not a Lumber, a Warrior and a Wizard, excuse me for uh you know just the two damage there and un uh, unfortunately just not going to be game we might have been able to stall but i think at this point tucker knew that things were not going to swing back in his direction so he kind of just threw the win out to hector very nice though from hector to assert uh the dragon dominance once again on the board um when they get big and they get strong dragons man they they hit they hit very hard uh but regardless a great first match to open up this episode here. And again, congrats again to Hector for picking up the win. Let's go ahead, though, and move into match number two and see what lies ahead for us. All right. In game number two, we'll see our old pal Vicious Val, otherwise known as Ovicious on uh, or in game, excuse me, taking on Bubakin, a yellow uh, druid, a crusader druid taking on a warlock crusader. So both men. I assume men bring to the table. Sorry, Bubba. Don't want to put it out there. But, you know, modern day 2022, you know, it, it do be what it do. Uh, anyways, let's go ahead and start this game off here. Bubba opening up with the classic Lumberjack turn one. And Val is going to respond in kind. Not a bad start here. Not a bad trade for either a player to take. Pick up a little extra card to help him out in the game here. Unfortunately, though, Bubba not going to be able to play much in this uh, particular hand. A lot of uh, three drops, including two traps but no unit. Val going to take the opportunity to pop the coin and summon a wizard. Uh, Bubba still not able to play a unit here, opting to set the deflecting shield trap. Not a bad one. Uh, but definitely makes me think that this is some kind of Voltron-esque deck, perhaps, or um, some yellow-red detonation shenanigans with Arbiter, maybe. That's also uh, a possibility here. Regardless, White Knight coming out the block here, uh, forcing the wizard to take a kind of step up. If you need to interact, and as you can see, we're going to see the armory from Val opting into that deflecting shield there, making a white knight that 211. Books and do a little bit of shenanigans here in uh, in trading, if you will. Uh, but now it goes back to Bubba. Going to throw the uh, Dragon Crest shield onto the white knight here for a little extra bit of help. Uh, clearing the books, priest to pop the little extra HP boost and a pass back from there. Meanwhile, Val opting to kind of just give Bubba some extra draw here because he can clear the white knight. Centaur and wizard nice duo combination there, able to clear out the big threat here, leaving just the priest on board. Although we do have dragon's fire, which of course it looks like we are going to use uh, to clear off the entirety of Val's push here. Uh, the centaur and lumberjack both burning up to the dragon's fire and of course the wizard being finished off by the priest not a bad interaction for bubba at that moment uh but we'll see val quickly able to bounce back here a priest of his own to trade and a wizard to boot making it a four six thanks to that extra priest buff uh and of course pretty scary here as we don't really have a lot of things we can do if we are a bubba unfortunately uh we do see the detonate get played here the salahar soldier the flame storm all things that he's just kind of putting on the works can and send in preparation i imagine griffin as the follow-up though from val griffin of course the big idiot of these uh decks which uh really is a tough card to kind of hit over if you're not prepared like uh, unfortunately bubba is in this scenario he isn't a clear way the wizard with a combination of uh, d disintegrate and drain life 
uh, which is nice, but does not get rid of the bigger problem, that being the Windfall Griffin. Bard and Ramus coming out to feel that thing, Sacred Quest and Bestial Rage to follow up. Uh, this is going to be nice here for him to pull a little bit of a uh, dirty board clear here. We do run into, unfortunately, the detonate, which I don't think Val was prepared for. But, of course, uh, he will take that damage and clear off the last of Bubba's units. Uh, Bubba does have a blue fire bolt, though. So, I imagine, yep, we're going to clear that away. Simple as that. Place the armory in the back to, uh, I guess, just see and pray if we can pull out anything. We could have used the armory to block. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of a rough scenario for us to use, so we're not going to opt to do that. Instead, just kind of praying here that maybe we can make it out of this. Wizard, Bard, another Flying Books, uh, the Rammers all being pushed up and in. But we're going to try and fear away the books to see if we can pull something here. Does pull Hand to the Saint, which is actually a nice way for him to stall out the game, but it might not matter here depending on how many more globals Val can put out on the board here. Right now, we do have about 12 points of damage, so any more that could be the game. At Centaur is going to be probably actually what puts this game away, yeah. Six going into face here, clearing out the armory because he can, because, you know, it's Val. Uh, using the wizard to hit into the uh, castle and the bard to clean up the rest of the game very nicely done uh from you there val uh picking up the w picking up the uh the nice win over i assume yellow red good stuff at the end of the day here because there were a lot of different factors moving in that list but overall uh i still see uh, it's still good to see that you bring up the victory here and uh yeah i think without further ado let's go ahead and jump right in to game number three all right and that last game will be Iron Will taking on Rhino, a Pirate Druid versus a Warlock Ninja. Uh, both very interesting combinations here. We'll see what both bring to the table as always. And uh, let's go ahead and get started here. As a turn one pass from both players here. I'm seeing like a fair opening. Uh, Masuda going to come out now as the first play of the game here from Rhino's side anyway. And uh, so far, looking like a lot of stealth and range. So uh, deck me focused around just keeping your opponent away from you, perhaps. We'll see. Uh, Dark Bender, thanks to the Masuda buff, will uh, pop on the board now. Masuda holding back, opting to uh, not move into the wizard damage, which is, you know, makes sense. Makes sense. Daggerstorm, though, unfortunately catching a little bit of the Dark Bender there. So this Dark Bender is on a clock. Uh, Rhino does get the wizard in, though. Does preemptively banish strike the Dark Bender as well. A nice way to kind of keep this alive in case that there's any more um, direct removal shenanigans from Ironside. But Iron, I think they just played the armory and pass, keeping that wizard where it is. And actually moving Darkbender into a place where it looks like it's going to threaten the wizard, uh, which is very interesting. But it makes sense, um, considering that the Darkbender is on a clock anyway. And if he has one interaction, he can bounce back safely to the hand here. Uh, yep, just like that. We'll see the armor get taken out here and the blacksmith as well. Uh, Iron trying to push up and find the Koru, but unfortunately was just that one step short. This allowing the Koru to get more into the enemy's back lines here and do some more damage potentially. We'll see if Iron has any more responses. Uh, Havel up top, the Fat Bard coming in as well here, but unfortunately we know that the Koru is up in waiting. Uh, opting to not push it in though, which I understand... It's a bit of a smarter play here because we do want to keep this thing alive for just a bit longer. We could have easily popped into the bard here, but that, that would mean we do lose the Koru. We could have Iconed as well, but still doesn't really feel as well, as, as good, if you will. Uh, so in the meantime here, everything is kind of pushing down a little bit here away from the Koru to prevent it from re-stealthing. Darkbender, they're going to clear up here, uh, pop the Lumberjack. The Wizard actually moving in to pop the Rat as well, kind of just sacrificing it to allow for this nice Shodan multi-strike combo. Uh, doing some massive damage potentially to this entire board here. Uh, we do see the I can get awarded as well. Fat bar being cleared, which I mean, sure, that's fine. But we could have also just put ourselves in a great spot to secure the victory if we just kind of pushed in and did the extra damage to Castle. He must be feeling very confident though. Wizard going ahead and hitting the Rat Hovel. Darkbender popping one of the rats here. Lumberjack being moved up, and I assume the Kunoichi too, because why not? Yeah, there's going to be the Kuno on the top row. Uh, beautiful work there. And of course, Koru kind of just chilling for now. Nothing really to do. And uh, I think at that point, just fine to stay up where he is. Call for aid coming out now from Ironside. 
uh, being able to drop one of these bad boys as well, too, which is very nice. Beast of Rage on the Ranger will be enough to clear out both uh, the Range units, the Dark Bender, and the Wizard uh, being cleared from the board here. And this is going to be a bit of a problem for Rhino. Um, now that all of his stuff was sort of taken away here, he does have to kind of bounce back and hopefully fast. I mean, he, he, we can still put Iron Will away, I think, easily in the long run, but we are running out of resources, whereas Iron Will still has nearly uh, two, three cards up on Rhino, which is a bit of an issue uh, when you're trying to go in this for the long haul. Do you see a combustion draw from Rhino, which I think we don't think I don't think we've seen combustion. I think didn't we see combustion maybe last game or was it something different? I might be thinking of something different in the fire department, but anyway, combustion. Bit of an interesting pull here, especially now since we've got uh, a nice little cluster for us to work with. Dark Bender moving in, the vanishing strike on said Dark Bender. Nice little touch here to pop the Ranger while also clearing out the rest of the board. We didn't clear out the Sea Witch, which is interesting. I think we probably could have met her off uh, hitting... Well, I guess we couldn't have hit anything else except for the Ranger. But it still feels off that the uh, Sea Witch did survive in, in that exchange here. I have to remember. I'm on a late night brain, so just to pardon my, uh, my ramblings as I might be getting some plays wrong. Some potential optimal things wrong. Ooh, Dragon's Fire is a massive, massive pull. And uh, very curious to hear how we don't actually see it being played yet. Uh, I think Rhino trying to bait Iron into playing more value on the board for a big Dragon's Fire. We'll see Rat King come away and chip at the face here. Same with the other rat up top. All the rats moving forward here. The Centaur as well with the Bestial Rage. Unfortunately, not getting any of the uh, plus one, plus one buffs. But still enough to take out both, or excuse me, weaken the Dark Bender uh, to a near lethal degree. And pop the Fat Bard, which is not bad. It is not bad for uh, Iron to kind of do that. Assuming that he has control of the board here. But we know Dragon Fire in the hand here. Going to go ahead and massively clean up everything on that board right now. Uh, mischievous imp badger dark bender all tech yeah, positions to push in for hopefully some final bits of damage we'll see what iron has in response uh the dagger storm hitting the imp and dark bender thankfully not revealing the dire badger in that um with the two landing on the i believe dark bender uh regardless oh dark fire dark fire actually does that win him the game Darkfire gonna go ahead. Badger swiping at the or swiping at the cannoneer. Excuse me. And then Darkfire cleaning up a good portion of the rest of Iron Will's board, popping cannoneer that top rat and one of the hovels. At this point, I don't think Iron's got enough room to recover. Two cards. Hopefully, they're both companions of some kind to deal more damage. Centaur coming in, dealing four. Is that enough? It is not. And Rhino. With the exploding badger of the evening, takes out Iron Will in a very well fought competition. Uh, very scary to see that, uh, you know, Iron almost was able to bring it back with his army of rats. Uh, but that's why you kind of hold board wipes for the such occasions, you know, things like Dragon's Fire, Flamestorm, very important still. Despite us not seeing a whole lot of rats or other swarm decks, there are still decks that kind of can produce these uh, incredible amounts of bodies very quickly with help from cards like Rat King. So it's, in it's important to kind of keep in mind that board wipes are still important in this day and age, but I'm pretty sure you guys already knew that. Uh, regardless... Congrats again for Rhino. Or to grat, congrats to Rhino me, for taking the victory in game number three. And with that, we're going to go ahead and move to close out this edition of TV Commentary. And with that being said, folks, hope you guys did enjoy this latest episode of TV Commentary. And if you did, let me know. Leave your thoughts down in the comment section on how you believe uh, these matches went. And if you guys, of course, did enjoy, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel and help us grow here on the platform. Again, hope you guys enjoyed, and uh, that's going to be it for me for now. So, until next time, stay gaming.